mechanical violator Hakaider retooled a popular 1970s supervillain into an android anti-hero to star in a stylish, darkly lush tokusatsu film that was unlike anything seen before. But a compacted runtime, even with an extended director's cut version, saw many of the film's themes, characters, and ideas go undeveloped. Once, there had been a grander vision for Hakaider. Once, it had been imagined as a major motion picture event that would introduce a bold new vision to audiences on both sides of the Pacific. Before the mechanical violator, there was. A Kiter Last Judgment. Japanese television of the early 1970s experienced a tension boom. The airwaves filled with all sorts of masked heroes fighting rubber-suited bad guys. Toei Studios, white hot off their success with 1971's Kamen Rider, needed a new program to ride the superhero popularity wave. This is when Yoshinori Watanabe, head of Toei's television department, tasked producer Susumu Yoshikawa to work with Kamen Rider creator and manga artist Shotaro Ishinamori to develop a new show. On Saturday night, July 8th, 1972, at 8 p.m. on NET, the time slot directly after Kamen Rider, episode one of their efforts debuted. Android Kikider was inspired by the tale of Pinocchio, telling the story of the titular mechanoid and his fight against the evil dark organization, led by the evil Professor Gill and his legion of robotic minions, the Destructoids. It was also a story that explored the drama of its hero, an android who struggled with his existence as an artificial being. Out of all my masked hero designs, I think Kikider is probably the best, said an impassioned Shotoro Ishinamori. Not many characters are able to be as expressive with such a simple design, from their personality to their story. I think I'm more attached to Kikider than I am to Kamen Rider, because that's the work in which I put so much thought into. Yoshinori Watanabe suggested creating a strong rival for Kikider to generate interest in the show's final set of episodes. And, with a whistle, episode 37 introduced the new villain, Hakaider. Wielding the impressive Hakaider shot and entering the scene to his very own theme song, the bad black bot became the undisputed nemesis of Kikider during his seven episode run. Though Kikider's ratings were at first sluggish, writes JL Kuroza in Godfathers of Tokusatsu Volume 1, they perked up when Hakaider was introduced. Variations of Hakaider were made the big bads of 1973's sequel series Kikider 01, but Kikider's battery was about to run out. As Kikider 01 concluded in 1974, unfavorable ratings caused plans for a third series to be dropped. The televised adventures of the heroic artificial being had officially come to a close. As the years passed by, the desire to flip Kikider back on always remained. Rumors of a reboot persisted at Toei for years, until Shotaro Ishinamori eventually started pursuing a Kikider TV remake. However, there was more interest in a Hakaider-centric TV show, mostly emanating from Yoshinori Watanabe, who, by 1989, was now president of Toei Video. Although he played the role of an enemy, Hakaider was as popular as Kamen Rider at the time, and his popularity surpassed that of Kikider, the main character in the series. Watanabe spoke in a 1995 interview. President Watanabe was extremely interested in Hakaider, said producer Yoshikawa, and was always talking about how he would like to make either a film or TV series with Hakaider as the main character. Watanabe believed that a Hakaider project would be a leap forward in comparison to a Kikider revival. And soon enough, Hikaider was out, and Hikaider was in. <sighs> to put it bluntly, Toei probably thought they were done with Kikider already, with his story altogether, despite the fact that there would be no Hikaider without Kikider, Ishinamori said on the matter. If possible, I would have preferred to make a Kikider remake where Hikaider was featured heavily, but I guess in the end, Hikaider was more popular. Ten proposals for a Hakaider film or TV show had been presented to Toei over the course of decades. According to producer Yoshikawa, none were ever realized due to production costs and other problems. There was also the delicate challenge of how to tell a story set from the villainous perspective of Hakaider, 
Anti-hero tales were uncommon for Japanese film and TV at the time, so the matter would need to be handled thoughtfully. That was precisely the scariest part of it, laughed Watanabe when asked about how the anti-hero angle was going to work. In my opinion, it is the people that break the status quo and jump into action who can be considered evil a lot of the time, but that precisely is also what gives them the potential to become heroes. Hakaider is a man who deeply pursues his ideals. That is his most defining characteristic. By 1994, the Hakaider Project was being developed as a live-action television series with Keita Amamiya at the helm. Amamiya was an artist and filmmaker who had worked for Toei as a character designer, working on various Metal Hero, Super Sentai, and Kamen Rider works. Directing unique tokusatsu features like Cyber Ninja and Zerum led Toei handing Amamiya the reins to 1993's Kamen Rider Zeto and 1994's Kamen Rider J. His unique style vibed well with Hakaider, and he and his company, Crowd Inc., came up with a number of story pitches and designs for the new show. Two of these proposed stories are mentioned in the Hakaider Complete Works book, and both sound very similar to what would appear in Mechanical Violator Hakaider. One plotline involved Hakaider, decommissioned for years, suddenly reactivating to go out on a mission to destroy a city filled with bad guys. The other scenario saw the key Kaider nemesis hunting down and destroying escaped inmates of a robot prison, with one of the convict droids holding the key to the lost memories of a woman mysteriously connected to Hakaider. It was around Kamen Rider J's release, between April and May according to numerous interviews, that the Hakaider TV show was then reorganized into a motion picture project with a proposed runtime of 90 minutes. The popularity of Kikaider rebroadcasting in Hawaii at the time supposedly prompted this shift in mediums, according to producer Susumu Yoshikawa. Steven Spielberg, who happened to see Kikaider at his vacation home in Hawaii, was very impressed with the episodes. Yoshikawa insisted to Uchisen magazine. Renewed interest in Kikaider stateside possibly could have been a factor, but it was far more likely the bigger pop culture phenomena overtaking the US that really did the trick. Saban Entertainment's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was produced through the licensing of Super Sentai footage from Toei and then replacing the original Japanese cast with American actors. This simple idea had created a monster hit in both merchandising and ratings, and by 1994, Power Rangers was entering its second season and had a movie underway over at 20th Century Fox. Super Transform! Toei and Saban additionally were planning more shows that would follow the Power Rangers recipe, including VR Troopers, which would go on to broadcast that September. This period in American pop culture is noted in the Hakaider Complete TV Magazine Visuals book. It briefly recaps the Toei Saban collaboration and all the shows that spawned from it before posing the question, what could this mean for Hakaider? Toei may have considered the possibility of licensing Hakaider to Saban. They did license out their other two features, Kamen Rider Zeto and Kamen Rider J, which were used in 1995's Mass Rider. Regardless, the success of the Saban partnership makes it easier to understand why President Watanabe thought the time was right to make a big-budget Hakaider blockbuster, a movie intended to have international appeal and lots of sequel potential. This is just the prologue, said Watanabe, the beginning of a very large project. Toei company Bandai had co-produced both Kamen Rider Zeto and Kamen Rider J with Toei in previous years, but, for reasons unclear, they would be absent for Hakaider. Instead, the Tohoku Shinsha Film Company would be one of the two businesses helping co-produce. Tohoku Shinsha had started in the 1960s, dubbing and distributing foreign properties like the Thunderbirds. They also had a track record of co-producing acclaimed domestic and international media like 1979's Shogun miniseries, Spirited Away, and Lost in Translation. According to interviews, it was an executive over at Bondi that matched Toei to Hakaider's third production partner, a company who was looking to get into the picture business. Sega. Video game company Sega had been mulling over getting into the film industry for some time, primarily interested in developing and investing in anime or movies that would feature characters with potential cross-platform appeal. 70% of the total revenue of Japanese films now comes from character works including animated films, but not many people in the film industry are aware of this," producer Yoshikawa said to Uchisen Magazine. I believe these films will be the catalyst to revive the power of the Japanese film industry. 
Sega saw Hokkaider as a worthwhile opportunity, so the company joined the production. They also began planning tie-in merchandise, including a Hokkaider video game that would be released exclusively to their new console, the Saturn, which was due out later that November. Hokkaider may become a trump card in Sega's business, brags the Hokkaider Complete Works book. And their joint enterprise with Toei Television in the United States right now boasts better share sales than its direct competitor, Nintendo. Watanabe kept Amamiya in the director's chair for Hokkaido, confident the young artist could deliver on the president's big picture vision. The next order of business would be to find a screenwriter. A call was made out to Kikaider Zero One scriptwriter Chuke Nagasaka, but Nagasaka, who was working on various TV dramas at the time, said he was busy. Nagasaka claims he doesn't remember this and regrets turning Toei down. But this led President Watanabe to meet with writer Toshiki Inoue, the son of Masaki Inoue, a screenwriter of many 60s and 70s era Toei films and TV shows. This included many of the Showa era Kamen Rider shows and even the original Kikaider. Toshiki Inoue would very much follow in his father's footsteps, racking up a staggering list of anime and tokusatsu writing credits which went on to include many contemporary Kamen Rider entries. By 1994 alone, he had written for Fist of the North Star, Dragon Ball Z, Ranma Half, and had penned at least one episode for every Super Sentai show from Flashman to Die Ranger. Inoue's preference for writing villains and talent to express complex thematic ideas in his work also made him an attractive choice for Hokkaido, a project with uncommon themes and characters that demanded high creative care. Watanabe hired Inoue and requested the writer to conjure an interesting story that both Inoue and Amamiya could have fun making. And by that August, a first draft was completed. Inoue's 160-page screenplay, entitled Hokkaider Last Judgment, featured concepts from Amamiya's Hokkaider TV pitches and reads like a longer, more detailed version of Mechanical Violator Hokkaider. Like the final film, the story is set in a post-apocalyptic city governed by an all-ruling senate. They work alongside the CBF Corporation, utilizing CBF suppression, a medical procedure designed to control disobedient citizens. Unlike the emotion-suppressing microchip that appears in Mechanical Violator Hokkaider, criminals are injected with worms, called fairies, which transform them into biomechanical, insect-like monsters. Secretly, these creatures are controlled by a wheelchair-bound, fair-skinned oligarch named Shirakura, who takes the place of the movie's antagonist, Gurdjieff. While Shirakura works for the Senate in the Human Rights Protection Branch and backs anti-government rebel factions, he secretly yearns to overthrow the Senate and become the sole ruler. Unlike his film counterpart, Shirakura lacks the enforcer droid Michael, who is completely absent in Last Judgment. <sighs> Present, however, is Kaoru, Mechanical Violator's female lead. She's relatively unchanged here, still written as a take-no-crap assertive tomboy type. A few notable differences are her lack of dream sequences, which are featured heavily in the final film, and that she is followed around by a kid named Akira, a callback to a character of the same name from Kikaider Zero One. Just like the beginning of Mechanical Violator, Hakaider awakens in a prison with no memory of who or what he is. He does, however, Remember a beautiful woman named Erika. Erika was the assistant of Professor Utenji, Hokkaider's creator. We learn Utenji created the robot to judge humanity and determine whether it was right or wrong. The android takes off in search of Erika and his lost memories, but not before encountering a military gang known as the Kill Dolls. Having been subjected to CBF suppression, the Kill Dolls transform into bug monsters and battle Hokkaider. He finishes off the monsters and retrieves one of his long-lost memory circuits from a corpse. Why exactly CBF suppression monsters carry Hakaider memory chips is not clear. Hakaider later crosses paths with Karu and Akira, joining their rebel guerrilla group to attack the CBF suppression center. Only Hakaider, Karu, and Akira survive the siege, and they find Erika deep in the bowels of the place. Before any explanation can be given, Akira turns into a CBF suppression monster, described as an incomplete half-insect, half-human monster with something like a human right eye and an insect left eye. With no choice, Akaider kills Akira. He then discovers another memory circuit on the boy's monster's body, another callback to Kikaider 01. This circuit reveals that Akaider's creator, Professor Yutenji, had been murdered by Shirakura. Erika explains that Shirakura created the CBF Corporation to take over the Senate and forced her to work with him. 
Hinting at some romantic interest, Hakaidar promises to return to Erika after it's all over, and he and Kaoru head to the Senate to confront the oligarch. The Senate teams with CBF monsters, but Hakaidar fights his way through in order to confront Shiakura, who transforms into a hideous monster, and a battle ensues. In a twist, Erika appears in the scene with a laser weapon described as the D-Stopper, the same weapon that was used to kill Professor Utenji. She reveals her allegiance to Shirakura and CBF before threatening to kill Hakaider, saying, I am a woman. You are a heartless robot, a cold mechanical demon, and I want the strong warmth of a real man. But Karu saves Hakaider, stopping Erika, but becoming mortally wounded in the process. Dying in Hakaider's arms, she tells the android of the good she feels in him. <laughs> That woman sure is stupid. Y you're definitely warm. These departing words have no effect on Hakaider. Betrayal and loss have only offered the android nothing but anger. Hakaider leaves the Senate, the outside now surrounded by enemy reinforcements. In the final scene, Hakaider moves towards them, undeterred, offering the script's final line. Humans. I will be the one to judge you. While Hakaider was in pre-production, Toei was facing a dilemma concerning the 1995 Toei Superhero Fair. Toei Superhero Fair. Held previously in 93 and 94, the Toei Superhero Fair was an anthology movie event composed of two 25-minute shorts, based on that year's Super Sentai and Metal Hero TV shows, and by a longer 50-minute core film. Director Amamiya's Kamen Rider Zeto and Kamen Rider J had served as the core films in 93-94, but Toei had no idea what would headline 95. A decision was eventually reached and by September of 1994, it was concluded that the Hakaider film would be the core film of the 1995 Toei Superhero Fair. This would require Inoue to retool his script, turning an hour and a half long feature into something that would play under an hour. I felt pretty disheartened about it, Inoue said reflecting on the decision to shorten Hakaider. It's not like the fundamental topics of the film were going to change if we had to cut some things here and there, but the thing that changed the most was the idea of Hakaider being a tormented hero, which disappears in the final version. Mr. Yoshikawa had told me that it wouldn't be cool if Hakaider was suffering all the time, and, well, I think he was probably right. The superhero fair decision delayed Hakaider's production by a month. Shooting was moved from November to December. Ino Ue got to work slashing Hakaider Last Judgment down into something that would fit 40 minutes. The shortened Hakaider Last Judgment script was delivered by October, but one more draft was delivered that November. Hakaider Last Judgment was no more. Now tentatively titled Hakaider, Ino Ue had whittled down his 160 page script to 46. This final manuscript plays out almost exactly like what would be featured in both the theatrical and director's cut versions of Mechanical Violator Hakaider, save for some small but interesting differences. The largest addition was the inclusion of Michael, the angelic android enforcer of Gurdjieff. Ino Ue felt the story needed such a character in order to challenge and contrast against Hakaider. Michael's transformation to Michael Tank, an idea pushed by director Amamiya, is featured in the final manuscript, but without mention of it having any resemblance to Kikaider as it does in the final movie. The oligarch Shiakura remains in this draft, but ditches the wheelchair and is now described as a handsome young man in white. He's basically Gurdjieff for Mechanical Violator without the name, of which he'd receive in a later draft. Hakaider displays some interesting new weapons and powers here as well, including the ability to reattach and repair detached ligaments with metal tentacles that extend from his body. He also has the Tonfa Cutter, an arm blade that was a carryover from the Last Judgment script. Hakaider even dispatches Michael this way, slicing the heavenly robot in half during their final fight. 
The Tonfa Cutter was eventually abandoned though for the final film after director Amamiya felt such a weapon had already been featured prominently enough in his feature Zedum 2 alongside the live action Diver films. Another surviving Last Judgment detail was Hakaider's ultimate weapon used to defeat the Michael Tank. In the final moments of the battle, mechanical parts pop off of Hakaider's body and attach themselves to the Hakaider shot, turning it into a giant rifle which Hakaider then uses to blow Michael Tank away. Hakaider's defeat of Michael Tank would go on to change at least two more times. Hakaider would utilize his arm shot in the theatrical version of the film and unleashed a chest-bound destruction cannon in the director's cut. And then there's the ending. Mechanical Violator Hakaider finishes in somewhat of a bittersweet way. While Gurdjieff and Michael have been defeated, Hakaider still lost his one friend, Kaoru, along the way. But Hakaider takes to the open road as his theme music blares. It feels triumphant. The good guys won. The finale in the final manuscript is much the same. Kairu has been killed, the bad guys have been vanquished, but tonally speaking, it fell much more in line with the ending of Last Judgment. Dark and ambiguous. Having just killed Shirakura, Akaider steps out of the ruins of the Senate, and the final passage of the script is presented. An uninhabited world, a quiet world, spreads before our eyes. Someone's hand touches Hakaider's arm. It's Kaoru, a phantom. We see a panoramic view of the Senate, with a huge dark cloud spreading ahead. Hakaider starts walking towards the darkness. The Hakaider final manuscript would not be so final, as it would undergo one last change into a shooting script form. At 53 pages, it contained all the changes that would be reflected in the final version of the film. With the script finally finished, Hakaider went on to film as planned that December before wrapping in February. On April 15, 1995, Mechanical Violator Hakaider, alongside Sentai O-Ranger and B-Fighter, hit Japanese theaters as part of Toei's 1995 superhero fair. The theatrical cut of the film was edited for the child audience, really emphasizing the action and heavily reducing the violence and character drama that had been featured in the script. This was fixed a year later when Hakaider got a director's cut that, among numerous other changes, restored 26 minutes of lost footage, mostly violence and character moments. Was there any filmmaker regret in hacking Hakaider down to 50 minutes for the superhero fair? It's likely. Producer Yoshikawa championed both the 50 minute and 90 minute versions of the film, but did state, If we were to make a complete film, it would have been better if it had been an hour and a half long. Considering how keen Toei was on Hakaider's sequel potential from the start, could the discarded ideas of Last Judgment be repurposed into a new movie? The filmmakers themselves were enthusiastic at the notion. Director Amamiya even expressed a desire to make a Hakaider trilogy. Sometime in the late spring or summer of 95, Toei and Sega started planning a new Hakaider project. Once again, a television series. While the involvement of Amamiya is unclear, screenwriter Ino Ue returned to create the main scenario for the show. However, before autumn, the Hakaider television series was suddenly deactivated. We decided to do something original instead of Hakaider, writer Ino Ue simply stated. That something original would be a Toei Sega produced tokusatsu TV show called Chanzerion. The Chanzerion project had been in development since the planning stages of the original Hakaider TV show, according to interviews found in the Super Light Warrior Chanzerion Bible. A series proposal arrived on Toei's desk by October of 95, and Chanzerion went into production shortly after. It would go to air in April of 1996, before getting its episode count cut short due to low ratings. With the TV show scrapped, a continuation of Mechanical Violator Hakaider seemed increasingly unlikely. But on December 27th, 1996, a sequel finally arrived. And it was Hakaider Last Judgment. tie-in CD-ROM video game that Sega had planned since Hakaider's production was released exclusively to the Sega Saturn at a retail price of 6,800 yen. Last Judgment plays mainly as an arcade shoot-em-up that features an extensive story mode, 
Keita Amamiya supervised the project while his company Crowd designed the new robot enemies that would challenge a kiter. Screenwriter Ino Ue returned to write the script that Amamiya helped shape. We wanted to do a drama, not just a shooting game, Amamiya told Sega Saturn magazine. Last Judgment the video game plays out like a second draft retelling of Last Judgment the movie script. It even introduces characters and tropes from the old television shows, including updated versions of original bad guys like Kikaider's Professor Gill and Kikaider 01's Waruder. Taking place 10 years after the events of the film, Hakaider is confronted by the new ruler of Jesus Town, Gil, with an ultimatum to join his army. Hakaider refuses and winds up losing an arm thanks to Gil's soldier, Waruder. Wanting to avenge his hurt pride and get his lost limb back, Hakaider attaches a spare right arm that he apparently keeps around and waltzes back into Jesus Town, and this is where the game begins. The player controls Hakaider as he shoots his way through Jesus Town, battling androids like Silver Horse, Grey Ant, and Pink Hippopotamus, homages to Kikaider's past pantheon of animalistic destructroids. One major concept brought over from the Last Judgment movie script was the idea of a mysterious woman who is somehow linked to Hakaider. In the game, we learn this to be Karen, the human form of B. Jinder. Originally appearing in 17 episodes of Kikaider 01, Bijinder was once a bad guy who eventually switched to the side of good. Her addition to Last Judgment may have even been foreshadowed in mechanical violator Hakaider. Hakaider's heroine, Kaoru, actually shares Bijinder's theme music that was used in Kikaider 01. This could have easily been a case of fan service, but the reference book, the complete collection of Japanese special effects in fantasy films, suggests that a Bijinder spin-off sequel had been planned. This would have had actress Mai Hosho returning as Kaoru, who would go on to become the new Bijinder. The character's addition to Last Judgment, including visual ties to Kaoru's bell charm, only bolsters this idea that somehow more had been planned for the character all along. In the game, it was revealed that Bijinder was the first human to undergo an experimental robotization process by Gil. This in itself has a slight echo of CBF's suppression and its transformative properties. While she does initially fight Hakaider, she switches to the side of good, but meets her end after saving Hakaider from a trap set by Gil. However, with the revelation that Bijinder's human body still exists, there remains a chance of saving her if Hakaider can upload Bijinder's memory circuit to her human mind. This leads to the game's final confrontation with Gil, who turns out to be nothing more than an illusion. The real power running Jesus Town is none other than Gurdjieff, freshly resurrected and robotized in a blue Hakaider type android body. After Gurdjieff is defeated once and for all, Hakaider is able to upload the memory chip and save Bijinder's human form, Karen. For Last Judgment's final moments, scenes from Mechanical Violator Hakaider were spliced together with new live-action footage shot just for the game. These scenes utilized the Hakaider movie suit and actress Yuki Akimoto as Karen, showing the pair safely riding away from the destruction of Jesus Town. As Karen watches Hakaider leave, it not only marked the end of Hakaider Last Judgment, but also the end for Keita Amamiya's Hakaider. Dreams of a global sprawling franchise, complete with movie sequels, video game continuations, and television show spin-offs would go unrealized. Hakaider's adventures were over. Yet, there still remains a small artistic triumph. Despite Hakaider being reduced from a 90-minute feature to a movie nearly half the length, the story and ideas created by director Amamiya and writer Ino Ue went unwasted, finding new life in a new medium. The artistic vision had been realized. It is a bittersweet closing, but perhaps a finale none the more fitting for the mechanical violator, humanity's judge, the android they call a kiter.
Now. 